will welcome everybody. I'm Mary Cargill, uh, co-director of LC Global Governance. I'm really delighted that we've got Carlotta Perez here, and I'm only sorry that we're competing with both the dean and exams, <laughs> or at least getting ready for exams, because I believe that what Carlotta has to say is incredibly important. Um, I first came across Carlotta's work in the 1980s during the period of Thatcherism. And at that time, what was exciting was that she seemed to offer a supply side answer that wasn't neoliberalism. And now, when we're in another period where we are deeply debating these issues, what's exciting is that she offers a demand side that goes beyond Keynesianism. So I think it's a really exciting, what's known as neo-Schumpterian solution to the, our current financial problems. Uh, Carlotta is an academic and a consultant. When we were talking uh, before we came in, I was saying that she's a walking public-private partnership <laughs> because she acts as a consultant both to government and to business on technology and to some very big companies. Um, she's also a Latin American, which means that she has a perspective from the South and not just a perspective from the North. So I'm really delighted and I think you'll find her lecture very exciting. My intention with this lecture is to share some reflections on the feasibility of such a sustainable global golden age, and it is based on my work on technological revolution. The content. I first will try to interpret the current crisis as a turning point, then to analyze the question of demand, opportunity, spaces for innovation. I will look then at the post-war example, the core of what I will say is to examine today's global opportunity spaces, and I will finally point to the challenges of recovery. So let's begin with the idea of the crisis as a turning point. I want to say that the current crisis is not an accidental event in the financial system at all. It is actually a historically recurrent phenomenon. It is endogenous to the market system, so in a sense it was inevitable. It results from the way technological revolutions are assimilated. And I hold that the collapse marks a structural shift in the forces guiding growth and innovation from financial to production capital and to the return of an active state. If history is a guide, a global golden age may lie ahead. Now, because in market economies, technical change occurs by revolutions, capitalism experiences pendular swings every two or three decades. From a gilded age like the one we've had under the control of finance in order to install the technological revolution and replace or modernize the old with a new paradigm, 
to a golden age under the control of production in order to fully deploy the installed potential during the previous period across the economy and to spread its benefits more widely. So what marks the swing of the pendulum is precisely the collapse of the major bubble. And what worked before will not work from now on. Just as what worked during the 20s did not work in the 30s and was fixed after the war. The historical record shows bubble prosperity, recessions, and golden ages regularly. If we look at the date, the revolution, and the core country, we have the Industrial Revolution first in Britain, then the age of steam and railway, also centered in Britain, then the age of steel and heavy engineering from 1875, where um, the USA and Germany were fighting for the hegemony with Britain, by 1908, with Ford's Model T, we begin the age of oil, automobiles, and mass production. And that one was centered in the USA, just as the 1971 revolution, the ICT, with the microprocessor, uh, was also centered originally in the USA. Now, each has had an installation and a deployment period with a bubble collapse in the middle. We get at the end of the installation period of bubble prosperity and at the beginning of the deployment period, what I'm calling the golden age. And of course, we would then be at now at the turning point. If we look at the Industrial Revolution, we have Canal Mania with Canal Panic and then the Great British Leap, which in fact is mainly the Napoleonic War. Then Railway Mania leads to Railway Panic and the Victorian Boom. In the third, we have the London funded, that was the first globalization actually, which funded the infrastructure buildup in the southern hemisphere. And then we had a globalization that was based on minerals and uh, meat and wheat and things that could be brought to the north, counter seasonally, with the invention then of the steamship, which allowed reducing to less than a third the time for bringing things to the north. So after that, after the crashes that happened, the Bering crisis and several other crises in all those countries which actually hit the London fund stock market very badly, we have the Belle Epoque in Europe and the Progressive Era in the USA. The next, of course, was the Roaring Twenties, automobiles, housing, uh, radio, aviation, electricity. And there we had a long, long period, whereas the others have been two, three years. We had 13 years, including the war. Uh, and then we had the post-war golden age with all the changes that were made in order to enable it. And finally, we have our own internet mania, telecoms, the NASDAQ crash first, then emerging markets together with that, the financial casino and housing bubbles that we just had, and now we have this, this crash this collapse. Apparently we're recovering. We're still not in the golden age. Can we? Can we really have now a sustainable and now global rather than just national or international golden age? What we can see through history is that golden ages have been facilitated by enabling regulation, mainly regulating finance, of course, but also other things, and by policies for widening markets and ensuring social stability, which have often included inter distribution. Now, the structural shift involves a change in the drivers of innovation, and we go from supply push to demand pull. Installation, the period of supply push, is a time when, when the drivers of innovation, the, the innovators themselves, are financed which uses all these technologies to innovate, and this time it was very obvious, but it was obvious every other time. Uh, and the new entrepreneurs, of course, the ones that are carrying the technological revolution. The state then is in a facilitating and service role. In fact, every time finance sort of pushes the state out of the way, because the state has been organized for the previous revolution, and very often the conditions are not favorable for the revolution that's 
the technological revolution that's trying to implement. But for deployment, we actually have the opposite. We go to demand pool, and it is production and the state that are the drivers and innovators, and finance goes into a facilitating service role. So what we really witness is, first of all, a vast free market experiment, and then the full flourishing of the installed potential under different conditions. So during deployment, the conditions for innovation in production depend on the effectiveness of institutional and policy innovation. We are then at the turning point. And I would say there are three tasks for governments after the major crash. First, intensive therapy for finance. There is no way we can get away from this intensive therapy. Two, redesign of financial regulation and architecture, and three, super important, enable structural change in the real economy. What has happened? Well, the intensive therapy was done, even overdone, and we might perhaps have another crash ahead. We have not, because the financial regulation and architecture is still on the drawing board. This time, global finance needs both a national redesign and a global regulatory floor. We cannot have global finance with national regulations. It's absolutely impossible. It's like trying to tame a horse outside in the street from the windows. You, this is impossible. So we've got to have it. Of course, it's very difficult. So it's less than on the drawing board. And then, we have the question of the structural change in the real economy. It's rarely being considered as such. People are talking about recovery. Recovery, just growth, you know, just quantity. It's not just growth. We're talking about structural change. We've got to go much further. And recovery will be very difficult without it. And one of the things, of course, in terms of structural change is not just in the real economy, but the relationship between finance and the real economy. Finance right now is in a very high percentage just a casino. It is really not a full part of the real economy, not a real ally. The process can be short or long depending on the social and political forces. And the last time around, it took over a decade and a major war. So we can be optimistic or pessimistic depending on how we measure the situation. Now the question of the opportunity spaces for innovation. Schumpeter held that growth is driven by innovation. I think that's becoming more and more common sense than it's been by almost everybody now. But it's very important that it's not a question of lots of little isolated innovations here and there. It's about interrelated systems of innovation that lead to growing synergies and externalities. That's how you get real growth. It isn't just little bits. And obviously, to drive growth, innovations must be profitable. But technology only defines the space of the feasible. The technologically feasible is much greater than the socially acceptable, and in turn, much greater than, economic, than the economically profitable. The factors defining the space of the acceptable and of the profitable change all the time. And of course, they change with every technological revolution, but they're constantly changing. But they are also changeable. They're changeable by conscious pursuit. So if we want to come to grips with innovation, we need to introduce the concept of opportunity spaces. There is the supply opportunity space for innovation and the demand opportunity space for innovation. What is the supply opportunity space? Well, it's the range of innovations that are technologically feasible and the global, national, or local capabilities that can bring it to fruition. So that's what we could do, a whole range. Now, the thing is that the demand opportunity space includes the range of innovations that are economically profitable and socially acceptable as defined and modified by institutional, social, cultural, economic, political, and contingent factors. So really, it's a very wide range of factors that will define what's acceptable and profitable, 
But that is what will pull out of the opportunity space, of the supply opportunity space, what really happens in a particular economy. The better the match between the demand and supply spaces, the more dynamic the economy will be. <coughs> what are then the elements of this demand opportunity space that we want to shape? First of all, the generic technologies, the infrastructures, the externalities, you have to have them and have them good and have them cheap. It is super important. Then the sources of demand, volume, which is aggregate demand, and the sources of demand, directionality, in which direction the, the, the demand is pulling that uh, innovation supply. Well, the supply opportunity space for innovation is going to be affected by these three elements. And the coherence among the elements, the synergy among them, generates self-reinforcing loops. Let's look at the example of mass production so we can see a bit more of what this is about. The demand opportunity space that shaped the post-war golden age was made up of Cheap oil and materials, universal electricity, road and airway network, which together were the innovation enablers for mass production. Then we have the aggregate demand made up and, and its profile and its trends defined by the welfare state, by the labor unions, by public procurement, and the credit system. And in public procurement, of course, the whole of the Cold War had a lot to say, which is what happens in terms of the direction, the specific demand direction as direction for innovation. We have, super importantly, suburbanization. The fact that we could have cheap land outside the urban areas with cheap construction for the workers to be able to own houses with electrical appliances on a car at the door and the supermarket near with refrigerated foods to put in the refrigerator, this whole thing gave an enormously strong direction to mass production, electrical appliances, food, et cetera, et cetera. That was the way that that way of life was shaped. Then we had, of course, the post-war reconstruction with Marshall Plan and all the rest, and the Cold War, which allowed innovations that were not precisely mass-produced. It was about things that were beyond mass production, and with that, there were many technologies that came that were developed, or of course, a lot of the efforts went in that direction. So the various elements were provided in different proportions in each first world country. So, but every, every one of the advanced countries had these three things. It was very different in the developing world. Now, of course, we say that Keynes was, you know, aggregate demand, and he was apparently talking mainly about quantitative factors, but he did see beyond. It wasn't just simple quantitative. He did identify specific opportunity spaces. There is a letter to President Roosevelt in 1938 when, when there was the double dip, where he said, first of all, what you need to do is increase the investment in housing, public utilities, with, which in this case is electricity, and transport. He actually saw trains and not automobiles, and, but that's because he was English, of course. But <laughs> Americans have their cars in mind. And he said, housing is by far the best aid to recovery. And he even added, I should advise putting most of your eggs in this basket. And still further on, he said, the growth of collective bargaining is essential. I approve minimum wage and hours regulation. A policy of general wage reduction is needed. So he was really directing the man towards the house and the workers' house. Millions of workers' houses wanting mass-produced electrical appliances and automobiles and the rest. So what are the current opportunity spaces? Well, after more than three decades of diffusion of the information and communications technologies and of their application to modernize and rejuvenate all other industries, we are ready. There is enough technological potential and enough knowledge about it among both producers and consumers 
to innovate across all sectors of the economy and drive a global golden age. So the current opportunity space, let's look at it for that global positive sum game, which I'm saying is possible, not probable, but certainly possible, is cheap ICT, full global development, and green. The direction of development is the environment. The amount of development is full, I mean, sorry, of demand. The direction of demand would be the environment. The quantity and the profile of demand would be defined by the process of global development. And cheap ICT is the basis. So what we have is that revamping transport, energy, products, and production systems to make them sustainable is equivalent to post-war reconstruction and suburbanization put together. Full global development, incorporating successive new millions into sustainable consumption, sustainable consumption patterns, is equivalent to the welfare state and government pr procurement in terms of demand creation. And cheap ICT, full internet access at low cost, is equivalent to electrification and suburbanization in facilitating demand, and this time, plus education because this time it's super important to have education. So access to internet means not only uh, uh, the infrastructure, but also education. Now these three forces defining the opportunity space are interdependent. If we look at the direction, the facilitator and the volume, Internet access is the social, economic, and geographic frontier of the global market. Anybody who does not have, have access to internet is not in the global economy. That is really the frontier. That's inside countries, outside countries, across the world, wherever. It is absolutely essential to be in that global economy where growth could happen. The ICTs are the main enabling instruments of sustainability. Because ICT technologies are themselves very much about information, about services, and about intangible things, but also because computer-aided design and computer prototyping and synthesis, computer synthesizing and all the rest allows an enormous amount of innovation with very low cost compared to what it used to be. So all industries can benefit from the advantages that ICTs provide. And then, only with sustainable production and consumption, consumption patterns is full globalization possible. We know very well that we only have one planet, so there is no way that all the Chinese could have the American way of life. It is it's just not feasible. So there is enough space and potential to lift all boats, but the markets cannot do it without the support of enabling policies. Before we continue, I would like to share the premises of these reflections. Because you might have been feeling that she left, is she right, what's she doing, is she pro-capitalist, is she socialist, but what's going on in this thing? It doesn't fit, right? Well, we're in the capitalist system where growth is driven by innovation and business is driven by personal ambition for profits. That's one of the premises. I am talking about the capitalist system. The legitimacy of capitalism depends on whether individual greed results in collective benefit. So when it does not, it's illegitimate. Golden ages are precisely about positive sum games between business and society. So what we've had up to now hasn't been a golden age. It has been a gilded age. It's very shiny on the top, but the bottom is just raw. So golden ages, when they have happened, have been, of course, they don't include all the society. Capitalism is not that generous. But it includes more. It can go further. Neither business nor society always know what will bring optimum benefit beyond the short term. It isn't just the state that doesn't know. Business and society don't know either. So intelligent, <coughs> informed, and competent governments, which is what we need, can promote the consensus required to define the positive sum game. 
this time we actually need consensus, the whole idea. I don't know, maybe the Chinese are showing us that you don't need consensus, but we'll see what they achieve. Strongly biased arrangements, I think, are economically and socially unstable. And that's precisely when it's all markets, it's too strongly biased, and when it's when you intend or attempt to do something which is completely for core society, you don't take into account all the elements that are, uh, then you create an unstable system. So let's discuss then each of these elements. The question of direction. Good. The societal challenges posed by the environment are not just for saving the planet. They are the best route for saving the economy. And they are also the most effective means for increasing the well-being of the many. And I think one of the reasons why it has been so difficult to do anything in Copenhagen or here or there or the other is because everybody is looking, not everybody, some people in England are really not seeing the whole picture, but in general it's not understood that the recovery has to have a direction and this is the most realistic direction. In fact, each technological revolution has led to a change in consumption patterns with new life-shaping goods and services at affordable prices. If we look at each deployment period and what lifestyle developed at the time, the 1850s and 60s, urban industry aided Victorian living in Britain different from the aristocratic countryside. It was a completely a sort of industrially shaped urban way of living. In the 1890s and 1910s, we had an urban cosmopolitan lifestyle, which was the typical of the Belle Epoque in Europe. It was a time when things came, you know, there was this globalization, so things could come from all over the world. So this cosmopolitan, this view of the world, uh, created a different way of living then. In the 1950s and 60s, the suburban, energy-intensive American way of life. And each of these styles became the good life, the luxury life, the best life that shaped people's desires and values and guided innovation trajectories. It's pretty awful to think that we are shaped that way, but in fact, it makes sense that the things that are good and are cheap could become the way of life of the time. So we have in front of us the possibility of the 1910s, the, I mean the 2010s, 20, 20s, 30s plus. What will happen? Will the developed and emerging countries develop a variety of ICT intensive global sustainable lifestyles? And I say that because, because these technologies allow variety with high productivity, and because the world has been somehow wanting to recover identity. You know, mass production was like a roller that passed across and ironed out every single possible difference. You open your eyes in any city in the world, I don't care which country it is, the poorest country, if you're in the center of the city, you don't know where you are because the buildings are the same, the way people dress, the thing, the store, the everything is, there is this, this massification that everybody sort of identical across the world. The, of course, the upper middle classes and the middle classes, not, not the poor. But the sustainable lifestyle would be both global and local. Now, each of these shifts is driven by the new technologies and the way they change relative cost and innovation potential. The techno-economic paradigm shift that's been happening since the 1970s, since information technology came on board, is taking us from the logic of cheap energy, mainly oil, for transport, electricity, synthetic materials, and everything else, to the logic of cheap information, its processing, transmission, and productive use. Of course, when you have the logic of cheap energy, producers' preference is for tangible products and disposability, and for the unthinking use of energy and materials. It's logical. What's expensive? Labor. You save labor. What's cheap? Materials. Use lots of materials. 
Now, producer's preference normally would be for services and for intangible value. And there is a huge potential for savings in energy and materials, precisely because of the things that information technologies can do, computers can do, and all sorts of computer-aided equipment can do. So we are facing a world that used to be of unavoidable environmental destruction, and in fact, that's what we are living through. That's what we're trying to solve. What mass production, what the mass production paradigm, the mass production revolution under that logic uh, did for shaping the world. So that world that was shaped by that, those technologies, we are now trying to transform it with the aid of these new technologies that have great capacity for environmental friendliness, even in themselves, which they haven't used enough precisely because of the conditions. It is a huge shift in the supply opportunity space for innovation, promising growth and radical changes in lifestyle. But you're all going to tell me, and you're absolutely right, that mass production, disposability, and high energy and material use are still with us. I mean, after 30 years of the information revolution, why are we still there? Well, first of all, the paradigm shift takes time, and it takes many changes in context. But that's not the most important. You know, the first automobiles also look like horse-driven carriages. That is an automobile. And what's under the driver is a horsepower engine and he is sitting there with a wheel but as if he had the reins of the horse and that is because every new technology is born within the world that preceded it and therefore it's very much shaped by it and businesses have their knowledge tied to the past so that is what has to be overcome to have the total paradigm but as long as oil and transport continue to be cheap, the mass production strategies will be shaping business behavior in the ICT world. So we are talking about a question of relative prices. Until those prices change, it's going to be difficult to go green. Now, let's look at the known but largely unrealized potential of ICT and green for producers. We can reduce energy consumption, materials use, emission of pollutants, etc. significantly. One can redesign materials, products, processes, logistics to reduce their size, to change the, everything about them in order to make them green. You can coordinate and optimize disparate technologies, which is super important for having appropriate technologies and also for having um, a variety of energy sources. You can optimize transport routes and means, value chains, etc. You can replace products with services, travel with telecoms, paper with iPads. Sorry about the, uh, but we have been waiting for the reduction of paper consumption and it hasn't happened. Perhaps things like the iPads will make us think that it's comfortable. But the technologically feasible, only becomes reality when facing a good opportunity space. Social value, policy, regulation, costs, and relative prices are the ultimate drivers of the shift. Yet the main consequence of strongly turning the environment into a central element of the opportunity system is defining a lifestyle different from mass consumerism. Once the change in consumer values begins, it is a mutually reinforcing loop with the producers, of course, because that's what you want, that's what you get, and if that's what's best and cheapest and good, that's how it will happen. But the shift cannot be moved by guilt or fear. It has to be moved by desire and aspiration. Nobody's going to change their lifestyle because they're guilty about what happened before. Nobody's going to change their lifestyle because they're afraid of global warming. Really, yes, a few probably most of the people in this audience. But it's a very small amount. We need millions of people changing their lifestyle. So it's got to be because it becomes great, lovely. That's a wonderful life. That's the best life. Changing those values, that is what's difficult. The change in preference it has to begin at the top of the income scale. That's how it really begins. And it spreads down and across by imitation and affordability. We already have part of the 
paradigm shift. It's already happening among the most sophisticated consumers. Natural versus synthetic, everybody wants to have the natural world and all these things. Minimalist design, I mean, what an opportunity. Gourmet and organic food. Exercise for well-being rather than being couch potato, which is what mass production calls us to be. Small versus big, the big cars, that pays. Multi-purpose products, well, of course, mainly in the in information technology world, but working from home. Solar power as luxurious as well as electric cars. All those things. Intense internet use. But there is still a long way to go. We have to go for durability, high quality versus quantity. You know the aristocrats used to look down on the on the bourgeois who had these very new things and they had their lovely suits and with their patches and their elbows and all, you know, very high quality. Well, it's perfectly possible to think that that's better than than super new. It's not impossible. It just seems impossible to us after so many years of this style, which was, by the way, fantastic because it brought millions of workers to, to a good life. So it's not, that's how it happened. But it's over and we've got to get rid of it. Repairability and upgradability. Remember repairing? Some of us remember repairing. Some people don't know anything about repairing. Can you imagine the jobs that could be created if we actually started having durable goods that could be repaired and were designed to be repaired and people trained to repair? Anti-waste, pro-recycling, low carbon footprint, customized versus standard, which is perfectly possible now, and that would make durability make more sense. Services versus tangible products. Active and creative prosumer versus passive consumer, which, by the way, the young are doing, not necessarily the big. So that is also hope, etc., etc. Much also depends on the marketing strategies of companies, which in turn depends on the best direction for profitability. And the direction of profitability <coughs> will in turn depend on relative prices and dynamic demand. So a clear rise in prices of non-renewable resources with a stable and reliable upward trend. And it's got to be stable and reliable, otherwise it does not work, would result in an energy and material safety bias on both the consumer and the producer. And this is really difficult to accept. But we've got to start thinking about how to do it. Markets will eventually do it because we don't have enough resources for the amount of globalization that's happening. So it's going to happen anyway. So we don't need to wait for the unavoidable scarcity to be reached. We've got to start thinking of some form of making depletion turn into, of course there is the carbon tax and all, I mean it's beginning, it's beginning. There are all sorts of things happening in this direction. So tilting the playing field towards green now would give time to bring forth the necessary innovation. Let's not wait until it's indispensable and then there is no time to do the innovations and we'll suffer the consequence. And yet you could ask, how can business profit survive in a world where goods are not disposable? I mean, that's what's been happening. In fact, planned obsolescence was precisely a strategy developed to face limits to market volume because the developed countries were the ones that could, and therefore, you know, after a while, everybody had one car, because they had two, everybody had one TV, two TVs, so how many TVs in a house, and so on. So you, so you had to change it, so that you would consume again and again and again the same thing. Where would demand growth come from if we really go for durability? If we really go for the idea that you're not going to be changing constantly the, um, the same product again and again, through fashion unnecessary? <coughs> well, that is the question of profitable demand volume. And what I say is that successive new entrants are the best solution for healthy and profitable market growth with minimum resource use. With the same resources with which the whole of America uses its sort of mass production consumerist style, we can do probably 
two continents with this other way of living. Full global, global development is not only a humanitarian goal, it is an economic and environmental imperative today. Income polarization is typical of installation periods and major global times. I'm sure you have all seen Piketty and Syed's work on the US income distribution. Or more the yeah, distribution of income tax payers. What you see here is the 1920s bubble. 1% of income tax payers in the USA in the 1920s bubble reached 25% of total income. Guess what happened in the 1990s and 2000s bubble? That 1% of income payers in the US reached 25% of income. But in the post-war golden age, 10% of income. Now, of course, part of that is income redistribution. Part of that was growth. It's just that when you have real growth, more of that growth goes to the actual people who are working doing it, so then it's two uh, elements combined. But that is very important. That's what a golden age is also about, is incorporating more people to high quality life. So golden age employment periods tend to partially reverse the process, widening the demand opportunities. Now this time, polarization has happened both across the globe and within each country. And when I say within each country, it's really awful to see the Gini coefficients of the US and England and all these countries going up, the Gini coefficient of China going up, and of course that's because the top is getting rich and the bottom isn't, so you have, there are different reasons why, but it's really serious that the developed countries have allowed their income distribution to become so unfair. And the globalization process has been biased towards Asia, not replacing the job losses in the advanced world and leaving whole continent marginalized. Uh, the Middle East, Africa, good parts of Latin America. Now globalization can be more balanced. Part is likely to happen through the rise in energy and transport costs, which is going to happen whether we try to push it or not. And the rest through national and global policies shaping the demand opportunity space. It actually has been done, and all countries would gain in the process. It's very important to clarify, because you know we've had all these discussions about globalization, that globalization is not about the demise of the state. It's rather about the possibility of global development across a highly differentiated economic space. The demise of the state was about installation, not about globalization. Globalization can be about, can really mean global development for all without having to be uh, neoliberal. Up to now, markets worked upon the pre-existing differentiation and in the process transformed the economic space. So what we now have is a mixture of the pre-existing things with everything that the markets did. Now we have a world that's completely different and undifferentiated. But it is time now for each nation, state, and region to identify advantageous directions for specialization and re-specialization in the case of countries that have lost their capacity and define the role they will play on the global stage. Is that possible? Do we really have this possibility of everybody specializing? Is there enough space for that? Well, there is an enormous variety of opportunity space. First of all, there is the fact that every single product market is now hyper-segmented, including materials. It's the so-called uh, long term. Many, many innumerable, innumerable niches in many of the product markets. Then we have the decomposition of the value chain by global corporations, which of course gives spaces for everybody, but it isn't just like it used to be, just screwdriver assembly. What's happening in, the, in this decomposition is that now even R&D can be outsourced. Even very, very high tech 
services are outsourced so that in fact the world can have high tech things even in the process of just entering through global value chains and then develop around that. And there is also the fact that there is peaceful coexistence of different technological levels. In the same supermarket, we find the organic and the standardized and the diet and the diabetics and all these, you know, super special and super different and super basic. They now coexist. That was not the case 40 years ago. You have only Kellogg's and four, three more brands of cereals and that's it. Now you have about 67 possibilities of cereals, which are made by all sorts of different companies and things. So uh, then you have the frugal technologies that are being developed in India and China for the bottom of the pyramid, and the highly sophisticated things. And they live together in the same product. You can have now a refrigerator that is battery operated, a little thing that costs less than 50 pounds, a refrigerator or a cooker that costs less than 20 pounds. And that coexists in the same world market with the ones that cost 500. Now the other thing is the advantage of network synergies because specialization and re-specialization uh, re provide network synergies. So if we're aiming at demand opportunity complexes rather than industries, you don't specialize in an industry, you specialize in a complex. So you can go in sports and leisure or creative industries or alternative transport and you have a whole range of things that seven, 10, 12 industries can go in that direction. You can, have, you can be in the textile industry and sports and leisure. Instead of being in the textile industry, you produce uh, material to make sales. And then that's actually sports and leisure and it's very expensive and it's much better. And through collaboration to supply complex product systems. So you get networks of companies that can provide very complex things like the Beijing Stadium or the Beijing Airport or whatever. You can have multi-source interactive power grids, high-speed railways, etc., which require many, many skills together and many uh, companies to collaborate. And that means they develop synergies and their and economies of specialization, but network and specialization at the same time. So there is enough opportunity space for all, and demand would grow for mutual benefit. I want to talk a little bit about the hyper-segmentation of markets and its different opportunities, because maybe it helps more than other things to understand what's happening. We're going from commodity to custom, as usual. In the, in the old world, it used to be that commodities were raw materials, custom, was something that went from wedding dresses to chemical plants or things that were made to order. And in the middle was all the good fabricated stuff. But now that's much more complicated. In every industry you have a whole range. In the commodity products you have price competition in basic products, but when you go towards adaptable you have competition in adaptability to clients. But from there up, there is an enormous number of specialty niches, no matter what industry you're in. So that at the bottom, you're talking about high volume, low profit margins and standard products. But as you go up, you talk about low volumes, high profit margin, margins through differentiation. I'm afraid I don't have time to give you the examples, which is a shame. And I hope this applies to uh, from raw materials to all manufacturing and services, and to each activity in the value chain. So you actually have an enormous space where it is possible to find different spaces of specialization, even in the same product range, but you're actually not competing with low-cost labor because you are now in a range where you have high, say you're doing uh, nano paint for non-scratch paint. Well, that doesn't compete with mass-produced paint. It's a different thing. And that's exactly, and the same thing when you're working for, uh, say, for third age products, they do not compete with the same chairs or whatever equipment you're doing for people who are not old. So 
when you specialize, either technically or by the market segment, you have a different sort of space for competition. So a possible pattern of global re-specialization by regions, and I'm sorry, it's super, super simplified. The countries with abundant local flavor would be able to do fabricated products for more and more differentiated groups and get higher and higher profits and therefore be able to increase the salaries of their workers and no longer have to be low cost, their only advantage. The countries with raw materials so, um, or cheap energy sources would be able to do differentiated processing, chemicals, new materials, special things with their materials at the same time, and that's important. Of course, the bread and butter of everybody is what their original specialization was, but the possibility of adding high tech to chemical processing, processing food, etc. And the more costly transport, the more likely it is that resource, that um, processing will be next to the resources to, to save on transport of heavy, low value goods. Then you have the intermediate countries with other advantages, access, transport, specialization, etc., and the advanced countries, which would be mainly in differentiated and custom, taking advantage of all the accumulated technological expertise. Sorry about the simplification. Each country would cover the whole spectrum in different proportions. Now, this differentiated economic expansion across the planet would mean jobs, incomes, and dynamic markets at home and globally for all countries. Finding effective ways of enticing materials and energy saving innovation and lifestyles would create jobs and markets besides saving the planet. And since resources are limited, global development with the American way of life would be impossible anyway, so green globalization could indeed be a positive sum game. Now, ICT as the technological facilitator, ICT has made globalization possible and can support environmentally sustainable innovation across all industries, sectors, and activities. ICT markets and global development can set up a mutually reinforcing feedback loop. Let's look at those feedback loops of the opportunity space. ICT. Internet enables globalization and one widens its frontiers. Global market growth enables the profitability of green production. The green direction of innovation favors the use of ICT. Global development marks the rhythm of growth of ICT markets. In fact, remember that GM, the boss of GM said that what was good for General Motors was good for the USA and vice versa. Well, what's good for ICT industries is good for global development and vice versa. Because that is what creates the markets. Because ICT is interested in widening markets and then deepening. And widening territorially is super important. The ICT paradigm and its generic technologies facilitate green innovation and, as we have said, only with sustainable production and consumption patterns is full globalization possible. So we're talking about a long-term positive sum game. Advanced emerging and developing countries can find their opportunity spaces and shape demand conditions in consensus direction. Home and global trade would provide market growth for all. Global businesses. Demand shaping policies would create stable differentiated spaces across the globe for sourcing production and targeting markets. So they would uh, business would be interested in this differentiation because then they can compete by using that to their best advantage, which is what the policies would try to do, of course, to get businesses local and global. Local businesses would flourish everywhere, favored by direct access to consumers or resources and by avoiding high transport costs. The last mile would always be there. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can happen thanks to being near markets. So everywhere there would be flourishing of local business and, and the population of all countries would experience employment growth and increasing quality of life while maintaining cultural identities. So what's the challenge, the triple challenge? Each technological revolution sets the space of the possible in wealth creation. The social political forces shape the direction. Mass production, the ideal of equality, and that ideal of equality 
was met through homogenization of the man. The welfare state turned the workers into middle class consumers. There was one best way, the American way of life, and we had a world divided into international, internationally into core and periphery, where the core countries advanced and took all the advantages of this, and the periphery generally produced raw materials, had all sorts of difficulties, and it's only when the technologies matured that we had all the miracles in the 1970s. So it was a very divided world at the time. Dependency theory was what sort of tried to explain what was happening. So what we had was national golden ages in the so-called West, in the developed world of the West. Now, what can we find with flexible production, ICT? Could we propose something different, like equivalent satisfaction instead of equality? That everybody in different ways would be happier and increasing their quality of life? Could we have different could we have a global rise in the quality of life? Different sustainable global lifestyles? Development across all countries? A global golden age? Perhaps. But there are three major challenges. The political challenge, the policy challenge, and the research challenge. The political challenge, we would need a triple alliance to build a program for a sustainable golden age. Social democracy, Greens, and Development Africa's, and anybody else that can be brought into the fold, aiming to engage in the business, to engage the business world in a positive sum game. The policy challenge: the institutional innovations required by such a program will pitch imagination against ideological and bureaucratic inertia. You know. If you look at the size of the innovations that were made for the global golden age, the whole of the welfare state, Keynesian policies, the, the institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the whole lot, I mean, the, it was enormous, enormous innovation at the time. We need now to get the financial world on board through carrot and stick. How to establish consensus building mechanisms we need to find out how to effectively help promote and fund development in the marginalized countries, and how to reach the right mix of pro-environmental policy through regulation, incentives, taxes, risk reduction, guaranteed markets, subsidies, education, legislation, tariffs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the center of where we have to innovate a lot. An intelligent and informed tilting of the playing field, globally, nationally, and locally. And the research challenge, whatever you think of standard economic theory, normal circumstances, interdisciplinarity is indispensable when we need to understand extraordinary times. Economics, technology, history, and institutions interact, and we've got to understand their interactions in order to be able to do what we now need to do, because we need interdisciplinarity when we have to support institutional creativity to make such major policy shifts. If it is true that the technological stage is set today for a sustainable global golden age, and I could accept that you might not believe it, but if you do, bringing it about would require determined political convergence and massive doses of institutional creativity. Will it be a success or a wasted opportunity? Whatever it is, we shall all be responsible for the outcome.
So it's not that they're, they're doing some of the new things. They've actually approved all sorts of rules that perhaps are going to be followed, saying they don't want to continue doing like these are five just uh, standard things, that they want Western companies to bring new technologies and to bring green technology. So they are sort of also serving as one of the forces that are inducing the West to do some of the environmental things, because the Chinese market is fantastic. But there are. Just to preface, I have um, in the past week published two letters in the Financial Times directly on this question of re-specialization um, of, the, of the productive base, especially in Britain, and hopefully uh, tomorrow or the next day there will be a third letter on the very same subject. Um, however, um, let me just uh, comment that I very much approve of your project of looking um, for the optimistic
advising both writing high risk or both kind of scenario that seems to be implicit in, in your argument. So I just wanted to push you. Um, how do you respond to the point about finance a bit more and how do you respond to the point about segmentation in global development, which will prevent the entry of all these new people uh, that you talk about? Well, there is one thing you didn't mention, which is corruption, which makes it also very difficult in most of the marginalized areas to really get things going. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is that it is not really uh, profitable yet for uh, the foreign companies to come into these countries. And I think that if the conditions were to change, say in the countries where, and I also say this in different cases, but I was thinking of, for instance, Africa or some of those countries that haven't been in Latin, in Latin America, that um, imagine, for instance, that energy prices were $150 like they were uh, <coughs> three years ago. Within two years, not only were there conditions of ch and changing just because they saw that and they thought maybe that this was going to really change. So there are conditions that are making it very difficult because all the advantage right now is in relation to labor. If there were a change in the cost of transport, then maybe many of the things that have been happening towards Asia could start happening towards Africa and towards the Middle East and towards Latin America. And processing could start uh, locating itself in the developing countries. So, but of course, I'm not answering your question because I still think that my answer is the same as before. That different countries, th the possibilities are there. So different countries would have to find their own way in this whole space, but only if the conditions of the world economy and if the conditions in the developed world were such that they would favor this, this thing to happen. So I'm not saying it's going to happen on its own, although I think it is happening in many places that the environment is being taken seriously in many places, and, uh, but not yet the social questions. These have not, because the space is not acting in most countries, which is not the case in Malaysia. Anyway, I'm sorry, but I think I haven't Thank you very much, and can I add my voice to um, the, the thanks that um, others have offered? It was a, it was a, that was a treat. So thank you very much. Um, I completely share your view that um, the uh, strong, creative, innovatory uh, burst of growth that could happen over this next 20 or 30 years will not happen without public policy. And uh, the change in public policy we need will not happen without the belief and conviction that this burst of creative and innovatory growth will come. Um, we have to make that case and be convinced in every country around the world. If you look at this year, which is extremely important from the point of view of the discussions in Cancun, just as important as the discussion in Cancun will be China's 12 12 year plan. There's a big fight going on those who see the growth story in terms of the object input output model, fixed capital output ratio of the middle of the last century, and those who see it in terms of um, what we can't use the term in public, but uh, endogenous growth and uh, uh, investing in ideas and learning from others and so on, together with the interaction of that story with uh, the environment, because we can create, we are creating an environment so hostile it would undermine growth. There are people in China who understand that second view very clearly, and as clearly as anybody that I and others have talked to about this. But there's still a fight with the old guard and the confrontation politics that we've seen in Copenhagen and elsewhere uh, actually strengthened the old guard and made that more difficult. So we have to, in 
terms of creating public policy, not only have very powerful arguments, uh, but also behave in a way that, that's collaborative and uh, constructive, if those arguments are to be won. And those arguments have to be won in China, in the United States, in Europe, and so on. We're winning, but we're a long way from uh, having won. So I think the story that you tell is fundamental. But it will need public policy. It's not, it's not the case that the rising price of energy could do this because there's a fundamental externality here, it's the kind of energy you use. High price of energy is not the same thing as a high carbon price. And this won't happen without that kind of policy. It can be implicit through regulation, it can come through a tax, it can come through markets. Probably all of those things. But that's the argument that uh, we have to win. I think it's perfectly possible to win that argument. I don't sort of shrink down into sort of pessimistic boots and say it will never happen. Because that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, if, we let, if we all agree that it will be impossible, we'll be right. Um, but this story, I think, is one that um, is fundamental to generating the kind of public policy we need and to the kind of institutions that we need. And as you know, some of us are spending all our time trying to build those institutions. Okay, now I have a question for you. So thank you for making clear that the shift to green capitalism is not going to be about a technological fix, but it requires some kind of institutional innovation. Then I have two questions, and one is the agency problem, because I think you kind of see the state as driving or shaping this kind of change. And my impression is that a lot of the real sustainable alternatives are actually coming from social practices and from the bottom up, uh, which is like already a kind of distributed uh, institutional innovation. And so we maybe have to learn to enable that kind of forces and how that goes with kind of state central policy intervention is one question. And, and maybe yeah, conflicting logics as well, more than consensus, this is what I see happening. And then the second question is, who is gonna appropriate the returns from the Green Revolution, which I think then it matters all of us because it is going to be, um, yeah, I mean, internet distribution. And then I'll take the gentleman back. Alistair Anderson from uh, UCL uh, Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I, you invited some in, um, interaction with uh, historians and uh, re regarded uh, that uh, this should be informed by history. Um, and while I tend to con concur with your characterization of the uh, past four and a half year currencies of the Kondratiev wave, I wonder, would you uh, entertain an alternative interpretation um, in the context of a super game that extends beyond the past 250 years, um, whereby the preponderance of what you term financial capital actually equates to Oswald Spengler's money power and the aggressive economic expansionism of the, of the last 250 years equates to the Macedonian and Roman empires. So actually the current mania for globalist ideas actually represents the death stage of a culture just as the Hellenic empires um, mark the death of the classical era and the onset of a, dark, uh, a new dark age. you say it's super important about the state. I think one of our, another problem, another ideological problem besides the neoliberal free market ideas is the notion that the state is only a central national state. The state today has to probably be a broker between something supranational, which we need lots, well we certainly need supranational power in terms of finance, but 
uh, for other things too, for many things that have to be sort of national, including environment and perhaps other things. But between those supranational institutions and the local, and the more and more local, because it isn't just one layer, it's several layers, and also the civil society organizations, the whole notion. Do you realize that NGO, non-governmental organization, the name comes from the idea that we thought that everything that they do should have been done by the state? I mean, the, the, the whole mass production thing was so state-led and so national because even the Keynesian policies were like a hydraulic thing that you did within the national space with frontiers that were very clear. And for a long time, people were having capital controls and all sorts of tariff barriers and things like that. So we had this notion. State means national. No. The state is the collective representation of society, be it in little bits or big bits or whatever. And if we can, and we are having more and more other institutions, local governments are becoming much more active. In fact, I would say that the real developmental states today are the local governments. They're doing, all, in all sorts of places, they're doing very interesting things. So I do think that the state is a much more complex thing, that what has to be done is many spaces for consensus and many actors to be involved. As to your idea of the dark age coming, I don't think so. I really think we have the possibility, I mean, I really think capitalism is a very contradictory system that does very many horrible things for a while and then it starts doing some better ones and that's why it survives. And I think that now there is this possibility. Uh, and by the way, I do not talk about Kondratiev waves. Uh, the Kondratiev waves are about up and down swings in GDP. My Technological revolutions are not, and they don't even have the same dates as Kondratiev dates. I actually changed the name to Great Surges of Development rather than Long Waves. So I sort of discussed that with Schumpeter, so it's not even that. But anyway, that's not as important as, no, I don't think we're at the death of the state. I think we have the best possibility ever. <laughs> 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 so, I'm going to uh, Which doesn't mean probably. <laughs> I'm going to take two more very quickly. Um, you, you kindly said. So I'll take Hillary and you. But just a very brief question because I can't see anything. Okay, well, just to say how exciting it is to have a sort of framework set out, a bit like one of those huge jigsaw puzzles where somebody else has done the framing and you can just look into the bits and one of the bits that I wanted to follow up is really the question of agency and I was interested in you know your uh, sort of diagram where you um, looked at the post-war golden age and then compared the equivalents in the in the new age the positive um, uh, sum game and one category that was missing in your equivalents is the is the labor unions as it were what's the equivalent of the labor unions in, in our in our present context. And I was just thinking two points really. One is that the point about the labor unions in your model, in a sense, is that they're, it, you, you provide a framework for, re, well, for rethinking them, in a sense, for, for, for thinking about them as economic agents, as, as actors in, a, in, a, in an economic paradigm. And in the, what was distinctive about them in that way, I think, just building on from what you said, is that they were, they were, they were about organizing around wages, around the mechanisms of demand. And in a sense, what one's seeing now in the nature of social movements, including the trade union movements, is, is, is a kind of a different kind of economic role where the unions, you know, in the best of, of union activities, actually around workers as, as producers, as skilled, um, as people with skilled capacities, and, and people organizing around the knowledge that workers have producing alternatives that break with the old forms of management. And then, in a sense, if you think about the social movements of the last, you know, since 68, but, you know, they're not in that, maybe social movements is always the wrong word because it evokes those notions of mobilizing and sort of, you know, being on the streets. Okay, that's part of it, but what's distinctive is they're often engaged in actual economic practices. So it's almost like social practices rather than social movements, you know, in a way, 
the women's movement, the ecology movement, the waste, you know, the ordinance fund, community, uh, uh, often cooperatives and so on, they're all engaged often in a, in a new economic practice, which links into your notion of prosumers. So anyway, just your thoughts on that. especially the, the bigger picture. But my question deals more with the specific choice of green technologies being the choice um, in your model. And I agree that the, um, the current economic trend is really pushing towards a more global economy. Um, and we certainly need, as you and others have advocated, broader global financial regulation. Um, but a core tenet of the sustainable revolution, if you will, um, is for people to hold a more local mindset. Um, and I'm wondering, how does a global economy and this green revolution coexist? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you mentioned the, the concept of iPads and paper. Um, and if it's not iPads, it's certainly laptops and netbooks. But paper is certainly more of a sustainable resource than computers are. Um, so I'm just curious how, how you see Well, uh, computers, if they were made once and only changed the software and were made absolutely beautiful and perfect and fantastic for your whole life, and very small and wonderful, eventually it would be much less. You could have about 25 dictionaries inside a computer. So I think eventually it would make all the difference. So uh, I, I do think they are compatible. As to labor unions, I only put in the model those elements that are indispensable for the economic structure. There are all sorts of things that are happening which are fantastically interesting, but do not actually enter into the question of the demand opportunity space. The labor unions did enter in the previous way, in the uh, whole way in which uh, society was organized because that was one of the forces that could be pitched in the field to guarantee that uh, productivity gains were turned into consumption power. So that is why they fought for wages and for free time because with free time and for pension so you could spend your whole month and for unemployment insurance so you could pay your durable goods and your mortgage. So all those things had to do with that pattern of consumption. Now we have a completely different situation. We're going to need flex security because people are not going to have jobs for life. Perhaps the whole idea that the, the, uh, you know, the mass of the workers being massive in order to get the wages and all that in, if you have changes constantly in terms of uh, skills, in terms of what is being produced, et cetera, we're going to have to think of another way to defend the weak that is not necessarily just the very typical labor union that had to do with jobs for life and with big companies with lots of people who were permanent. There, are, there is an enormous amount of sort of flexible work which you can either try to stop, which I don't think you can, or actually find ways of guaranteeing that those incomes that are irregular, those will become stable and those lives can have security and all these things. So we've got to invent many things to facilitate workers. But there is also something very important, which is that in the past, the whole idea in, in that mass production model, when you were doing assembly work, you were supposed to leave your brain at home. You were being told exactly how you had to work and what you had to do and leave your brain at home. And it was all designed by the engineers. So you had the division between the doing. Today, the whole idea is that with every pair of hands, you get a free brain. And that brain wants to, to have quality of life at work, and at work and outside <coughs> work. And that's the battle for having a good life inside the job and outside the job like intellectuals do. And that battle makes the whole difference between what, what people ask for 
and what labor unions could demand. I mean, labor unions. I wonder if we would have to have territorial unions now because it's not sure that industries are so clear. I mean, it's clear that uh, British Airways has a group of people that really work for them and big companies, would, but there are, there are complexities that have appeared now with the way that workers are incorporated that make it very difficult for a classical labor union to fight for the same things as before, to organize the same way as before. So there is a lot of innovation to do there too. 